Thank you very much to all of you for being here and sharing this with us. This paper I will be presenting uh, was awarded uh, a best scientific paper at the Hong Kong meeting of the APO uh, in February. And um, the one interesting with multifocal IOL technologies is that it's been very slow to be adopted by doctors and it's hard to understand. Um, in the current French market, it represents 4 to 6 percent of the uh, IOLs implanted in a total of 800,000. In the global market, it's less than 1 percent. However, when we talk to experts around the meetings, as I do, you realize that most of them are doing between 50 to 60, 70 or even 80 percent of cases. This is my personal curve of adoption since uh, 2010. And you see that the, there is a decrease of the monofocal lenses in gray and a sharp increase with the stabilization of the multifocal IOLs in my practice. One of the reasons why we have trouble adopting things is that we don't understand them fully and clearly. And uh, I appreciated very much the present talk that explained why everything has to be balanced in terms of multifocality to get the best of everything. Uh, the reason why we have trouble understanding the surgical compensation of presbyopia is that it involves not only optical factors but also neurosensory and perceptive factors associated to the retina and the brain respectively. And all these uh, uh, functions of the vision that we are not routinely assessing in the practice, they have to do with the outcome in terms of success and perception by the patient. So. What I would like to share with you today is my own personal experience at the clinical outcome of those multifocal lenses. And I will compare uh, the main lenses, the top of the market in France that we have, including the Liberty that I came across about five years ago, and um, with other, other lenses, such as the Atelisa Bifocal, the Lentis M Plus, and the Physiol Fine Vision. Um, you can see that my surgical uh, protocol is very simple. It takes six to 10 minutes for each procedure using only six instruments disposable. Uh, the refractive outcome is very consistent to what is generally obtained and there's no difference between the lenses. However, what's very interesting here is that when you compare the lenses, you see that uh, about 40% of eyes obtain both Jaeger 1 and 2020 vision uncorrected monocularly. However, uh, depending on the type of the lens, the proportion of eyes that reach a certain level of visual acuity at 65 centimeters, which is the intermediate vision we need for a digital world, uh, this is markedly different. As compared to the bifocal, you see that uh, we have above 80% of eyes would get a better visual outcome at intermediate distance for the most advanced lenses, including the Medicontour that reach uh, 94. So, you can translate it into a more sophisticated uh, measurement of vision, which is the defocusing curve. It's long and tedious to do that for all your patients, so we don't have as many patients doing this, but when you compare the defocusing curve for the different lenses, you realize that we have a very perfect match to what was explained previously in terms of light distribution and light intensity at different defocusing distance. So uh, it's very interesting that the clinic meet the science there uh, by showing the difference in defocusing curve for intermediate vision for the physio, the lentis, and the medicontour as compared to the more conventional bifocal lenses. Another way, again, to show this is to um, study the proportion of eyes, uh, cumulated percentage of eyes who reach a certain level of visual acuity at 65 centimeters uncorrected. And uh, the visual acuity is on the bottom uh, uh, scale and the percentage cumulated eyes of uh, uh, reaching that amount of, of vision is on the vertical scale. You see here that we have a best cumulated percentage for the Medicontour, followed by the Lentis, followed by the fine vision, followed by the bifocal Atelisa lens. And what it tells you is that you have to measure a number of different parameters to really have a good understanding of what the lens will provide to your patients in the real life. Uh, again, you see that for near vision, it matches uh, perfectly uh, the light distribution that was exposed in the previous talk. You see here that we have a difference between Medicontour that had the highest uh, uh, defocusing curve uh, with respect to Lentis and uh, um, Physiol, and uh, even better than the bifocal lenses as well. 
you see here a dynamic assessment of the light distribution with a varying aperture, the entrance pupil of the eye. And you see that for the Mediconto, we have this nice light density coming for 250, which is really the pupil we're having for most patients in a decent light for reading or using tablets or computer screens. So that's what counts in real life, how much light you're able to put at this focus uh, for a certain diameter of the pupil. And here you can see that the Metic Contour uh, Liberty lens performs quite well as compared to other lenses. Uh, this is um, a comparison of the light distribution for 225 millimeter aperture, that's for near vision, and a 4.5 millimeter aperture that's for five vision, such as like night driving in the older patients. And you see that the Liberty behaves very nicely as compared to its competitors in terms of balancing this light distribution for more efficacy depending on which situation the patient is. Uh, again, this matches pretty nicely what we have found with the defocusing curve here. We don't have the, so much time to go in details, but this is very interesting, again, to match all these parameters to understand what's happening. This is another approach, which is to measure the binocular defocusing curve, because it's not forbidden to play mix and match with these eyes and have an eye that is corrected with a lens that it'd be slightly better for distance, another one that'd be slightly better for near, if you have understood how the lens behave. And when doing this, you realize that you can obtain defocusing curves that are very similar to the one that you would be measuring in patients that are much younger. Another way to assess the clinical outcome, the very simple way actually, is to compare paired eyes. Uh, most of my patients have one lens of one type in one eye and another lens of another type in the other eye. And you see here that depending on the uh, distance, five meters, 65 centimeters, and 35 centimeters, we can have different scores uh, showing the subjective preference into the spare eye series. And what it shows is there, again, the Medicontour, the Liberty lens, is very balanced as opposed to the Physiol and the Ataliza. Um, this is the paired study itself, where we compared really what's happening between the two lenses. And you can see that you can never get everything at all at once for a similar lens. So you have to sort of mix and match if you want to get the best results. And here you can see, for instance, that Medicomputur provide a better score for preference as compared to the lenses for distance and near, with, uh, while having a very acceptable score for intermediate vision, for instance, as compared to the Ataliza. Um, so this is very interesting also to uh, go back to the optical bench and see why we're having this, especially if we want to study the unwanted visual effects such as photic phenomenon. And this has been explained already, so I will not spend too much time on it, but you see that we now have the numerical tools to simulate what's happening on the optical bench with those lenses and have a clear understanding of where we are gaining and where we're losing. And this is very interesting to understand that, again, the science meets the clinical outcome. There are two uh, very valid studies uh, made by colleagues in Hungary and Belgium, which uh, investigated how much contrast we were jeopardizing with those lenses. And uh, you see surprisingly good results with the Liberty that is explained by the fact that we're suppressing the unwanted uh, stray light uh, from incident light in the eye uh, using this uh, restricted uh, 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 seven rings central zone in this diffractive structure. You see here that the unwanted uh, uh, visual effect are also explained by this uh, light distribution and you can see here that having a, a smaller diffractive zone with a smaller number of rings makes it far better uh, in theory and in practical purpose uh, for uh, unwanted visual effects such as halos and glare. Uh, this is the uh, uh, study by uh, Gyuri uh, showing the very limited amount of halo and glare in this series of uh, 100 eyes. This is another comparison that lets you understand very nicely, actually, that's exactly what the patients are describing. A very elegant way to ask the patient about unwanted visual effect is to ask them to, ask, to look at a diode in the uh, opposite part of the room and switch off the light. And they will tell you nicely what they have. And this is clearly what we're seeing. When you use a diffractive lens, you always have some kind of halos at night, which generally disappears one or two months after the surgery, sometimes three to six months. But really, they don't uh, jeopardize the vision at all. 
using a, a refractive design, you may also have an unwanted visual effect that is the coma represented here that is slightly different from the halo and a bit more bothersome in the beginning. It takes a bit more time for the patient to get rid of this unwanted visual effect uh, with no adaptation, but eventually they do. We've gone over this light distribution thing uh, uh, already, so I wouldn't go over it again. And um, it is interesting to use these 3D maps of uh, uh, the light distribution uh, with respect to MTF to understand how EDOF lenses behave as well. And you see there that, again, it creates a lot of halos. Um, I would like to finish this uh, presentation with my personal uh, assessment of what the multifocal now can offer to our patients. First of all, uh, having lecturing everywhere, I understand that a lot of doctors fear to use multifocal uh, IULs very much. And they, they doesn't, there's no need for that. This is a clear example where I had this uh, tough case of exchanging uh, previous DZEC by DMEC in this patient. And you see that after the DMEC was done, she developed a cataract and I had to do the cataract. And I didn't have any objection using a multifocal in this patient and she obtained a very, very good result, 20-20 vision in the distance, Jagger 1, uh, near, not Jagger 12. And um, another aspect of my personal experience at those lenses is how I have evolved in my choice of lenses over time. In the beginning, we only had Restore and Technis, and then came Atelisa, which broke the barrier of apodization and uh, convenient bifocality. Then came trifocality with the Physiol, and that was a hit in France, a very successful lens. But then I started using Lentis M Plus and Medicontour. I was lucky to come across these lenses, and, and uh, they performed slightly better than what I had before. So it became my dominant choice for a couple of years. But then my dominant choice now is really Medicontour, which is the, clearly the most polyvalent balanced lens on the market. And I'm trying now different lenses such as Panoptics and PrismSmart uh, to see what I can get in addition to what I already get with Medicontour. So you see here that nowadays Medicontour Liberty lens represent about half of my eyes. Another reason why I discontinued the Lentis M Plus is that you have to have confidence in the material you're using. Uh, there is uh, reported cases of uh, lenses uh, getting calcified over time with this particular uh, uh, lens. And so I wanted to stop this uh, so that I could have more information about this process going on. So I want to finish this presentation by summarizing the main characteristics of uh, lenses that are available for doctors around the world in terms of trifocality. Uh, you have different lenses, they have different designs. Uh, the Medicontour Liberty design is very original. This elevated phase shift is quite difficult to understand for non-physician, but it actually works both on the optical bench, simulation, and also in the clinic. Another feature that I like about the Medicontour lens, it has a very large diameter, so that it's compatible with sulcus implantation. And also, it's a very high Abbey number. In other words, very low chromatic aberrations, which is always helping to improve the clinical outcome for patients. Uh, we've gone that over uh, the um, elevated phase shift already. That's very technical. I refer you to the excellent presentation of Dr. Fernandez. And uh, this is my conclusion. The Liberty Lens is a very solid, optimal choice for most patients. Um, it has a natural yellow filter, very low chromatic aberration, low index, so low dysphotopsia, precision manufacturing with sharp edge against PCO, an advanced diffractive design that permits a very satisfactory uh, visual outcome for patients. Thank you very much, and uh, I would like to invite you all to Paris, my hometown, to celebrate uh, the ESTRS in 2020. 2020 is not an instant number for vision. Thank you very much.